I know you guys are going to have access to this, but out of habit, I always say uh, I'm more interested in giving you the story than you write down the exact numbers. Uh, as an economist, I'm always given lots of numbers, right? And we never get anything exactly right. But I'm more interested in getting the core point across, look at the exact slides and so forth later. I'll show you where they're at in addition to NIA resources. I will also reiterate, in addition to the kind introduction, um, Lee Schultz actually did more of this specific project than I did. So he gets the credit. You can give me the blame if you want if there's something you don't like. Uh, but he's not with us today. I want to give him full credit. Throughout this, I'm going to refer to the year of PDD, and I suspect this group knows this even better than I do. But when I say that, I'm referring to September of 2013 through August of 2014. And where that basically comes from is where we had this spike, where we got way above this threshold. You guys relate to that very well. But in our economic analysis, we're going to look at what that year was expected to look like from a profitability perspective to what we think actually occurred. And then I'm going to try to belabor why producers did better than we expected. That's the real point of this talk I want you to think about. Because I'm not convinced it will always be that way in the future. Okay? So one of the things I want to do, just kind of hold your hand a little bit through this, is to look at the year before and then the year we're talking about and see where the real changes occurred. So the year prior to PDV, yeah, that's easier. Yeah, Thank you. The red button there. Okay. Compared to the year of PDV, we basically had no change in sow fairings. So that's not the source of any economic change we're going to talk about. The main change, of course, was pig safe per litter. And again, you guys know this better than I do. We had a 3% drop. That was the main immediate impact from PDV issues around the country. That, in turn, gave us a 3.2% drop in the pig crop. So before you go any further, this looks like a supply-side impact, right? The economist trying to walk you through what does this do. That's where this story starts. One of the, my closing remarks is going to get at heterogeneous impacts across operations. And one of the heterogeneous aspects is size. And I think this is interesting because other disease cases, again, that you guys live in more than me, have been kind of the opposite. This is operation size information from uh, USA NAS. All operations grouped together first. So now we actually use the laser. And then the smallest, 1 to 100, all the way up to over 5,000 sows. And I have two, purple, two sets of purple arrows. I work at K-State. I like my W-2, so I use a lot of purple in these slides. All right. We go to all right here. The 2014 bar is gray, and it's roughly equivalent to that green bar. But you come over here, you see that's 2009. I've highlighted that because we basically had a five-year setback in productivity when you look at the industry as a whole, when you go to all. But when you dissect this from smallest to largest, I've got another purple arrow right here, you have to get to the operation size group of 500 to 1,000 before we saw a hit in 2014. The two smallest groups... Now, they are small, admittedly. 1 to 100 and 100 to 500 did not have that hit. They go all the way to the largest ones. The hits were larger. Okay, What's that mean? The larger the operation, the bigger the hit during that year. That's not always the way this works. When you talk about biosecurity and aggregate benefits of responses to this, I think it's important to keep that in mind because, in general, my observation is the industry responded to this and, quote, unquote, cleaned up its act in different ways. I'm not going to say they're doing stuff wrong, but there's just stuff we do differently today than we did before. And if you do that where the bulk of the volume is, that has some spillover for national protection going forward. If this story was reversed and the impacts were the largest here, we wouldn't have that same level of aggregate volume protection going forward. So I think that's important to keep in mind. Okay? Back to this chart, right? And the reason I put it there is because that's all that previous chart was on a pig safe per litter point. That's where we start. Well, fast forward. If you're a fair to finish operator in Iowa, for example, you care about the impact after I sell my market hall, right? So what's my total return after I'm done with what I actually get revenue for, which is selling a finished pig? So we got to get all the way to the finished pig part of the story. So January 14 through December of 14, compared with calendar year 2013, you can do that when you're looking at hog production because of the biological differences here. Okay, hog slaughter was down 4.6 percent, largely because we had fewer animals going through the system. Okay. So again, I know you guys know this, but you have fewer pigs in the system, we slaughter fewer later. The part that was a surprise to some was the amount of an increase in carcass weights. So carcass weights went up 3.3% in the year of PEDV compared to before. Somebody tell me why. There's more than one reason. We had a lot of room. Holding is longer. We had room to do it, right? We had space to do it. But just because you've got physical room doesn't mean there's economics to do it. That made it possible, right? Market price went up. Corn price went down. All three of those lead to this. 
Okay, very rational decision. If I'm a hog producer, I have fewer pigs, and therefore I've got space, so I could hold them longer. Corn price went down a lot, almost two bucks compared to the year before, and we did not see a hog price crash. Add that up, you don't need a overqualified economist to tell you put more pounds on it. Okay, and that's what we did. But the net of that was pork production was down 1.5 percent. So yes, we produce less pork, but not nearly the extent that some were suspecting, given the 3 percent reduction in pig safe per litter. Everybody follow that? Okay. That's where the background work for what Lee and I did comes from. So there's nothing new in any of that. Okay. So what Lee did was he went back, and most of you probably know Lee puts out monthly farrow to finish feedlot, uh, feedlot farrow to finish return series uh, projections as well as historically to say how profitable it is to be a farrow finish operator. When he looked at what he was doing, that September 2013 number, so right before PDV started, what things were looking like was we were expecting 20.48 finished pigs sold per female per year and a bottom line of a positive $14 return per market haul. Pretty good year. Not the best year, but a pretty good year was what he was projecting. Fast forward and look backwards, right? So get through the entire year of PDV and let's look back at if you are the producer that was not impacted. So there are some producers that did not have an event. Okay, so that's where I'm going to start my story. So if that is you, and we're looking backwards, so now we have 2014 estimated where you still have exactly that 20.48 finished pigs. So I'm having no difference there. The positive surprise for you was you made 54 bucks instead of 14. And where that came from was the average total revenue jumped by $43. Okay, remember those heavier pounds? Those heavier pounds were sold at a higher price than we expected. Cost went up just a little bit because we did buy a little bit more corn in aggregate, but that was very much trumped by selling a much more valuable and heavier pig. So if you are the lucky one that avoided PDV, it was a really good year. Okay. One of the things before you do an analysis like this would be, okay, well, that sounds good, Tonzo. That sounds like an academic exercise. What about the guys that actually experienced it? What was their bottom line situation? So we look at that as well. You guys probably can't read these numbers in the back, so I'll just give you the punchline. But the right-hand side of this slide is basically giving us different outcomes for small to large impacts on pigs' wing. So the smallest impact we considered was a 3% reduction in ultimately finished pigs sold. Okay? So if you had a very, let's call it a very small impact, so you only sold 19.87 pigs off each sow, well, you actually net return was $52. So it's still a lot better. Go all the way to the left, if you had a 43% hit, so now we're getting pretty severe, but we didn't shut you down for the year because you still sold 57% of what you thought you would, right? Well, then you had 11.67 finished pigs sold per year. You got that increased value we were talking about before, but your total cost went way up. So your total cost were 186 when we thought they were going to be 146. And the reason is you have a lot of fixed cost that you're spreading across a lot fewer animals you've sold, right? So your total costs go up. That ends up still being an $18 net return better than you expected before all this happened. Now, this is where I'm going to sound like an economist that's you know, talking about both sides of my mouth. It depends if you look at net return per head or return on investment, whether that particular operation had a better year than he expected. If you look at net return, so just dollar per head, 18 bucks is better than 14 bucks. That sounds good. But if you count for the fact it took more money to operate, the total cost went up a little bit, the return on investment actually is a little bit lower. So 9.4% when we were expecting 96 So that's where we stop right here. Is roughly speaking, if you had a 43% hit, you're kind of indifferent compared to what you expected that year to look like. Nobody's going to raise their hand and say, I want PDV. Don't take it that way. But compared to your profitability expectation on September 1st, that's roughly the same. Does everybody follow that point? So if you were fortunate enough to have less than a 43% impact for the year, you had a better than anticipated year. If you happen to be worse than 44, which obviously there's some that were, then it was worse than you expected. That's the key point. So as Harry said, one of the reasons Lee and I did this is we were asked to do it, as we talked about at ASS, but it's also instructive to think more broadly. Why that happened, and I'll actually challenge you to think even deeper, is is it likely to play that way again in the future? And I'm going to say no. I think we were just kind of fortunate in an aggregate. Uh, and before I play my bearish hand on that, I'm from a farrow to finish operation in Missouri, so don't take any of my remarks there saying I wish ill on the swine industry. That's not the case. I think we're just very lucky in that case. 
One question you got to think about is why did hog prices increase as much as they did? Because they went up a lot, 25 to 30% basically in that span. Well, first of all, it's easy in hindsight to say they shouldn't have went up that much given a 3% impact. But you got to remember, in the heat of the battle, there's a lot of uncertainty on how many pigs are being lost. And if a market's unsure of the supply impact, there's a lot of examples in the past where we run prices up to make sure that I secure some portion of that reduced supply. So there was a lot of pressure upward on price. And you'll see that on futures market chart here in just a second. That's important. The second one would be is the entire industry was very fortunate that there was not a domestic nor an export demand response. There's been other cases when that hasn't been the case. So I haven't used the term demand until right now. It's all been a supply side story. But the consumer did not step away from or did not tell you know, Kroger to quit buying from this operation or any of that kind of stuff. None of that developed with PDV. And that's where my point of that may not always play out that way comes to mind. is because in the future, if you have an adverse demand response, you won't be better off by having a year of PDV. Okay? This is the chart. It's just the different uh, lean hog futures contracts. You can see across the top their label. There's eight of them. And then the gray bars, those correspond with the quarterly hog and pigs reports. The key part here is between the December 27 to 13 report and then the March and the June report, there was a, depending on the exact contract, a 25 to 30% rally in hog prices. That is that is what's underneath that revenue increase that we're talking about. The reason I would argue that the market did that was we didn't know how many of those pigs were being lost. And we realized the market kept taking the pork. Mm -hmm. right? Exporters didn't shut, the, shut it off. It took both to facilitate that. Okay? So to hit a nerve for some that maybe have more gray hair than I do, who remembers what H1N1 is? Mm -hmm. Right? More oftenly referred to as something I don't, I, kind of, I try to refuse to say, right, in the general media. But I remind you of that because that event had a demand response. And I remind you of that because the next round of PDV or its parallel in the swine industry could have a demand response. The swine industry was fortunate that didn't happen on the year of PDV. Okay? Mm -hmm. To the tune that pork demand was up 7% that year, we had a 10% increase in retail price. You don't get a 10% increase simply because of that relatively small supply reduction. You get a 10% increase because you have a small supply reduction and the public actually wanted more pork. You take away the public wanting more pork, you would not have had as high of a lean hog price as we did. All those margins I showed you earlier would not have been as optimistic and fruitful. Okay. All right, so that's that point. Down here, I just have one bullet is to fully recognize. It's one thing to say what the impact on a farrow to finish operator is. That's obviously not the only stakeholder in the entire swine industry. So packers, processors, distributors, retailers, everybody else in the chain that heavily relies on high volume throughput obviously was impacted. Right? So if you're expecting to run 100 pigs and you can only run 40, that's a problem. For the exact same reasons that Paul was talking about, chain capacity issues and cost of business and speed of business, all those kind of things, that's a real deal. We didn't touch on that in this particular effort. There is a study by Phil Parlberg, who's at Purdue, uh, and it was actually kind of done in the middle of this whole event, that quantifies some of those impacts. And I didn't bring those numbers to you. I can give them to you if you want. But effectively, these groups right here, they were harmed because of PDV killing their volume throughput. They're not positioned to take advantage of the rallying lean hog price the same as the entity that sells the hog, like the fair to finish up here. Okay? What are some of the longer term implications? And this is my last slide, is I think we need to step back and recognize if you have profitability that exceeds expectations, we spurred on expansion more. So we're seeing some of that now. That was one of the things that came from that event. Another thing would be is I think it raised attention to the need of economic analysis on different things, such as vaccines. Um, actually, one of my other talks today is going to talk about just because a vaccine or some other tool works doesn't mean we're going to use it. Uh, so, for example, we have E. coli vaccines. You could give fed cattle and feedlots. They technically work. We don't use them because the economic environment is not there to use them. So I just remind you of that. Some of the tools we talk about for dealing with PDV may not be used if there's not an economic carrot or stick. I prefer carrots because there needs to be an economic reason one way or the other to use those. Stricter biosecurity measures certainly developed and have been implemented as a result. I think we'll all agree there's always room for improvement. But I think a long-lasting uh, contribution of the year PDV will be we have a cleaner system than we did before. 
and I'll go back here to my larger operations being hit more than smaller ones is very, very important on that story because the higher volume of our production made some of those changes than would have been the case if it was just small operations over here. And then lastly, I've said it three times, but I'm known to be a broken record. I'll say it a fourth. I don't predict we will be as fortunate as we were and there will be no demand response in the future. That's important to appreciate. This specific one, we did not have a consumer demand response. I would assume you will and hope you're wrong, to use some of Paul's verbs a minute ago.